Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Episode 3 of Navigating Vision Loss, today's eye-opener. Today's eye-opener is about chickens, but not chickens the way you may think of it, either chickens you're going to eat or chickens you're going to keep as a pet, or somewhere in between. In the mid-70s and early 70s, my relatives, now I, I, my father is 100% Irish, literally, he had his DNA done, it's like 99.8 or something like that. So he's 100% Irish. I'm, I'm uh, 50% Irish, and uh, I was always told I was 50% Sicilian. There's a little bit of mixing of blood going on in there, as we found out, but for this purpose, we'll just say I'm 50% Italian. When we were kids, our relatives referred to Christopher and I as having something called chicken blindness. Now, we kind of heard this when we were little, and I mean, it didn't really make sense to us. And, and over the years, you know, we kept kind of hearing it that, oh, the relatives back in Sicily, they used to call people like you to, uh, as having chicken blindness. And I, I never really understood what it was, except everyone always knows, or many people know at least, that chickens don't see well at night. So therefore, the thinking is that our eye disease first presented itself really with uh, night blindness. There's that term I don't like, but very much reduced vision at night. And I say that I'm not trying to soften the sound of it by saying very much reduced vision instead of night blindness. But when you hear blindness, you think, uh, like, uh, like we've talked about, you think zero vision. And that's, that's not really true. So, but whatever. So, night blindness. Chickens have night blindness, and uh, therefore the kids, Christopher and Kevin, have night blindness. Yeah, that, that was fine, and it never bothered me, the term. But as I've begun this process of really kind of getting out there, getting in front of this eye disease, and talking about it, and eventually I'm going to discuss those reasons why I'm even doing what I'm doing, more than just trying to help people who also have may, you know, who may also have eye diseases or whatever. But I mean, there's, there's specific reasons I really didn't talk about it much growing up, up until very recently. But so we had this chicken blindness. Now, you take that and you correlate it with the fact that some of you may know that uh, I have pet chickens. Yes, I said pet chickens. And if you know me or your friends on Facebook or Instagram or something else, you've seen the photos, the evidence, how chickens can actually be pets. But I'm not here to argue the merits of chicken pet keeping. Chickens, and I mention this when I give my talks around uh, the state, chickens, right, they don't. They don't see at night. However, we first usually start off with the fact that chickens actually see very well. During the day, they have incredible eyes. They can see colors we can't see. They have a third eyelid that's clear, so they can always keep their eyes open, whether they're taking a dust bath, so they can see predators. They have incredible vision. I mean, they can see hawks and and other predator uh, birds so far away, long before we even notice them. They notice everything. And they have an incredible field of vision, way much uh, larger than a human. So their eyes are actually really amazing. but. The truth is, and and it is true, that as soon as it starts to get dark, and when it is dark, they can't see anything. They literally shut down. So the correlation between Kevin and Christopher having chicken blindness and chickens is very true. There is, it's a very true statement. In fact, when you have pet chickens, sometimes you have to do things to them or maybe move them or do something, you know, apply some cream to their foot or something. Uh, You're always encouraged by people who have kept chickens in the past as pets to do those things at night because they're so i mean docile is not the right word because they're docile anyway but they're so compliant because they they just can't see anything so they they just stay very calm and um and let you do whatever you need to do so christopher and i have chicken blindness and i'm okay with that because i like chickens christopher and i started going to massachusetts eye and ear infirmary in the early 70s, and that's up in Boston, Massachusetts. There was a young doctor who had just come out of Harvard Medical School, and he was a retina specialist. And somehow, I honestly don't remember how, I was very young, but we started going to him. His name was Dr. Elliot Burson. And Elliot Burson was at the forefront of retina and retina diseases and inherited retinal diseases. 
but he was very young. He'd just come out of, like I said, Harvard uh, Medical School. My father just came out of Harvard Law School a few years earlier. And so there we were, and we would go up at least once a year and get tested. But this was the very early stages. They were really testing to find out what the heck was wrong with us because they didn't really know. Now, one doctor may say it was retinitis pigmentosa or some other disease, but it really wasn't in the end. But in the early days, it was just a lot of testing, and, and they were really trying to stretch the understanding of, of, of how we see, what we can see, what we should be seeing, what we shouldn't be seeing. And there was, there was really tough times, let alone that the testing was brutal, and it still is somewhat to, the, to this day. It's gotten easier with digital technology, but the early days were brutal. But we'd go up there, and we'd be as I like to say, tortured all day. And we'd be tortured all day. And, you know, in the end, it was never good news. There was one time, Christopher and I, we got asked whether, um, like, a city bus, like a huge Greyhound-type bus, just would disappear in our vision. And when you're, oh, whatever age we were, eight, eight years old, 10, 12, as we got into our early teens, those kind of questions were, frankly, they were kind of offensive. And we started to get kind of annoyed with it. But, but early in the 70s, it was much more just trying to figure out what's going on, what are the symptoms, what are the, you know, what, what all the tests show, and the retina function, and all this. But ultimately, there was never an answer. They, I think we spent a lot of time trying to figure out what it was. But in the end, it just never, it's not going to get better. And there's nothing they can do. There really still is not anything they can do. But in the early 70s, they told us we would be blind by our teens. And I'm talking blind, 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 as we say. So that's, a, that's not a fun way to begin your early teens, or even before that, being told that by the time you're in your teens, the boys are going to have no vision. And they tried everything they knew at the time. We would try um, these sunglasses. That at that at that at that, back then they seemed really funny to wear, right? They had like um, <laughs> you may remember from the late eighties, people used to wear them skiing. They were like really dark sunglasses, but then they had almost like a cloth on the sides. And we tried to limit the amount of bright sunlight that came into our eyes. The theory was that high levels of sunlight could be damaging to the retina and everything else, and therefore would make our eye disease worse and progress faster. So we did a lot of things like that, just trying to um, slow the progression. If it was going to be a progressive disease, just slow it down. A day at Mass Eye and Ear began with a typical acuity chart, just like you would do at your regular eye doctor. You know, how far down the lines can you see? And then there was always a color test, which I'll tell you a little secret. For a long time, Chris and I were acing the color test, and I think we confused some people at Mass Eye and Ear because we should have some color issues, and we do. But what Chris and I had independently figured out was that if you looked at the colors that they used to test your eyes, and it was this row of colors, like these round uh, thimbles almost, you, turned, you, you, you put an order of the color, next darkest or, or next lightest, and you build it across going to the, from dark to light. We figured out independently we did not collaborate on this. There was no collusion. We figured out that the things, the thimbles, were actually numbered underneath. So each of us, what we would do is we would line them up by the number, of course, and we would ace the test. We figured that out much later. We were talking about it one time, and we started laughing when we disclosed that we both were doing that independently. That explains why we were doing so well in the color charts. So you do your acuity, you do your color, you do your visual field. This was kind of a very simple test, not painful, no pain involved at all. But you put your head in this half, half circle dome, and they would bring in a light. You're kind of looking into this dome, and they had a way of projecting a light onto it, and you had a button that you would push whenever you saw the light. And so they would start with a big light, a bigger light, like a size maybe like a quarter, or maybe a nickel. And they would move that light from the edges in, and as soon as you saw it, you beeped your button. And they were able to build a picture of where your vision loss was, your islands of vision loss. It was really cool. And the longer the test went, and the smaller they made the light, the larger the portion of vision loss. 
And so at the end, they could take this chart, basically, and show you the eye and show you all the areas where you don't see. They still do that to this day. Same test. Some things have not changed after way more than 40 years. Then you would get patched up. But first, they would dilate you. Dilation, that's okay. I don't like how, you know, how your eye re responds to it. But dilation itself is fine. It's not painful or anything. So they dilate your eyes, and then they quickly patch you up with all these patches so you have no light coming in. And then Chris and I would sit there in our chairs, uh, you know, talking, but we couldn't see anything at all. And we would talk and listen and whatever. And by the way, Mass Eye and Ear today is the exact same office, same chairs. I swear the carpet hasn't been changed. Nothing has changed. They must put all their money into research, which is good. After about an hour of being patched up, dilated, we would be led into the ERG test, electroretinogram. This is a test like no other test. They place contacts in your eye that are super thick, okay? They're not like, like a contact you may be familiar with. They place these thick contacts in your eye. But first, they tape your eyes open. And they put this liquid on your eye, almost like a jelly, like an ultrasound. And then they place the contact on the jelly. And okay, you might be thinking, all right, I wear contacts. Now they're not like normal contacts. And then these contacts, don't forget, your eyes are taped open. Then these contacts have wires coming off them that goes to a machine. And what they proceed to do in the early days was much worse. They proceed to send electrical current into your eye to test the electrical function of your retina, which was brutal. There you are with your eyes taped open, dilated, electrodes coming off contacts that are in your eye, and they zap you with electrical current. The way I used to describe it was it was like looking into the sun with your eyes taped open, a form of torture. It was horrifying. I used to grab onto the table underneath me with my arms and hands, and I had to literally, in my mind, go somewhere else to get through it. And it wasn't just for like one second. It was many, many minutes per eye. It was terrible. We dreaded it. And, and no matter what, it always showed terrible retina function and, um, you know, a, a declining retina. So it was, you know, in the end, there was no point to it. It was just a numbers thing. They would get a, oh, you know, whatever. The normal retina operates at a number 40. You guys are at a 0 0.01. Okay, great. So we, we know we have an eye disease. Thanks a lot. But the torturing was just, it was horrible. I will tell you that I recently was there and had the test done, and they have made um, strides. It is nowhere near as bad. Um, I think it's through the digital technology, the cameras, everything's so much better that they don't need to be so bright white lightning into the, into the eye. But at the time, we dreaded this like no tomorrow. That was the quick version of a day at Mass Eye and Ear. It was a full day, too. You, were, you got there very early in the morning driving up from Connecticut, and then you'd stay all day, you'd get lunch in between, and then you would um, finally meet with the doctor at the end of the day. After all the tests are done, you'd meet with Dr. Burson, and that's where we tried to really understand what was going on, and the questions came out, and the personalities clashed, because no one really knew what was going on. And, and you know, my parents, thankfully, weren't just going to sit back and say, okay, they're going to be blind by their teens. No, they had questions and they wanted to know things. So it was, uh, those are fun, fun meetings, but that's just the overall of a day at Mass Eye and Ear. And we went through that at least once a year for our, most of our lives. So the seventies growing up in where I grew up in Simsbury, you know, really, even though we had this eye disease going on, we, 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 we never we're allowed to use it as a crutch, which I'm glad we, we couldn't. Um, we played outside in Simsbury. We had great friends and neighbors. We played all the games outside at night. Ghost in the graveyard, kick the can, all those things. We did all that. We may have needed more light. We may have tripped over a few more trees, but we still did it. It didn't slow us down. And so my eye opener of the day is, regardless of where you are and what you're dealing with, don't let it slow you down. Be careful. You got to be careful. But stay with it. Keep trying. You'll get some lumps and bruises along the way. But even though we had this eye disease, we still pushed forward. We didn't rely on it as a crutch, as an excuse. We weren't allowed to. There were certain things we couldn't do. But it didn't prevent me from being a kid 
I would say the next section in my life when the, when the eye disease became kind of to the forefront, it was always there lurking, but was when you kind of entered into high school and you know, dating and potentially driving and this kind of stuff. That's where the next section um, began with the eye disease when it started to really kind of get in the way. And that's where we will pick up next time we do one of these eye openers. I appreciate you listening as we just kind of go over the history to get us to where we are to then get going where we're going. Again, my name is Kevin McNally, and I welcome thoughts, comments, constructive criticism. You can email me at kevin at successwithvisionloss.com. Visit that webpage, sign up. You can get automatic notifications of these uh, audio podcasts when they come out. I won't spam you. Have a great day. Thank you.